Welcome everyone to a session of IWIN, the Illinois Workbased Learning Innovation Network. I'm Heather Pensack, Director of Innovation and Implementation with Education Systems Center. Um, and if you were here at one of these sessions earlier this summer, um, we had some folks come in from California as well, who talked about a school-based enterprise model that they have. Um, so would love to, again, encourage you to check out our resource hub for that. But um, some members of the Ed Systems team had the opportunity through ConnectEd and other partners to travel and see some schools in California and what they're up to in terms of college and career pathways and building those opportunities for students. Um, and we took a lot of really great learnings from there that we're incorporating into our own conversations, but there's a few things that just really want to make sure to share broadly with you all and with the state as you all are thinking about um, specifically in here, your work-based learning programs. And so we have a very fabulous presenter here today who's going to talk to us about their programs and, and mentoring and the internship programs that they do. Um, and I'm just going to do a very brief intro here. So would love to know who's here today, right? Especially for our presenter as they're thinking about what they're going to share with you all, um, who you are always, right? Name, title, where you're from. Um, but if you have any questions kind of like top of mind for you um, about mentoring or internship, and I got any questions tops of mind for you. So, you know, multiple top there, I don't know. Um, but if there's anything that you're thinking about when it comes to establishing a mentoring program, when it comes to running an internship, any of those just kind of, you're, you're still struggling with those or, or something you haven't quite grappled with yet, um, please put those in the chat along with introducing yourself. And we can be thinking about those as we move into the presentation here, um, knowing that we'll, we will have time for Q&A for sure. We have just one presentation today where they're gonna share, um, and then we're really gonna dig in and wanna answer the questions that you have I went is meant to be a really collaborative community of practice space to learn about things, um, but also really have time to discuss and share with one another. And so if this is your first I win session, um, we are a, a statewide network. We really came about back in October 2020 now here um, as folks were grappling with like, what does it look like to do virtual and a quarantine fully remote space? Um, but we've really grown from there, right? We highlight and explore lots and lots of innovative models. We really are focused on what are those models that actually provide broader and more equitable access. Um, a key piece are, is the connections among communities to share best practices, learnings, and resources. And then where there can be kind of suggestions or needs at, at a higher policy level, um, we do have partners from like ISB and ICCB and other folks um, who attend these sessions and who we engage with regularly as well. Whereas we're hearing from you all, um, we're flagging those things up at those levels as well. And I'm going to put this presentation in the chat too for you all, but there is a link to a resource hub here um, where you can find all kinds of recordings and templates and materials related to work-based learning. And then if you got this in our newsletter or if this was forwarded to you, um, you can sign up for our newsletter to make sure you don't miss out on a session. And what we're talking about here in Illinois is really focused in on this work-based learning continuum. Um, so what you're going to be hearing today as I'm thinking about especially those of you all who are looking at the college and career pathway endorsement and kind of meeting the different components of that. Um, the mentoring program can very much be in the career uh, exploration space as you're thinking about that and what it looks like to have that direct industry engagement and have young people learning about different occupation areas, learning about themselves. Um, and the internships very much so are in that career development experience area. So, so for those of you to kind of put into some context as you're thinking about okay, when I hear about this, what qualifies as what? Um, I think you're very much in the exploration and career development experience space here, but it's all about building along that continuum. Um, and this is why I'm so excited for this presentation today because the mentorship program really does build up and support students as they go and then move into more intensive program like an internship. I wanna give a couple of <clears throat> brief, I guess, announcements here. So we have two upcoming IWIN sessions. Um, one of them was in a recent newsletter on December 14th, where Valleys, um, they're going to be talking about work that they're doing to onboard and support employer partners. Um, they developed even a micro-credential and materials for what it looks like to get employers prepared to host young people and have them on as interns in their space. Um, and then also in a couple of weeks, we've had three communities in Illinois um, who received some small kind of pilot grant funding and we helped kind of facilitate the process where they piloted a health science career exploration event. Um, they did that in collaboration with uh, both secondary, post-secondary, and an employer partner, a hospital partner. And they were also trying to make this really multi-generational. So providing information and access to opportunities 
um, and career and education pathways for both students and their families. So really excited for them to share about their work and the different ways that they went about hosting those events. And then the other piece here, um, some of y'all have heard about this, but there is an opportunity so to promote Cybersecurity Awareness Month, which I think was actually this last month. So we're at the, just at the end of it here, I'll still kind of say it's October. I can't quite believe it's November. Um, so the Work-Based Learning Alliance has partnered with IBM Skills Build for an opportunity um, for high schools to participate in earning a badge through the IBM Skills Build, um, but also for 250 students to have a paid cybersecurity capstone project. So once they would complete their badge through IBM Skills Build, they could do a capstone project um, and they would receive, I believe, a $300 payment for that. So we had an info session about this, um, but wanted to open it up a bit here. And I've put the link to the recording and presentation from that um, and some information here. If this is something you're interested in, you can contact me directly um, or there's an email address here through the actual Work-Based Learning Alliance who is coordinating this. Um, if you're interested in engaging in this opportunity, it would kick off um, in the spring semester, right? But they just want to know your interest within the next couple of weeks here by Monday the 14th so that they kind of understand how many slots they filled and maybe if they need to recruit um, for more of those slots potentially as well. But wanted to make this available to you all um, and turn it on over to our presenter. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Liz Rush. Nice to meet you. I've had the privilege of working at Claremont High School for the last 20 years. I started as an English teacher and then an academy coordinator. And then um, my most recent position was as uh, academy coordinator running all of the work-based learning systems at Claremont High School, which includes uh, what we'll talk about today, a mentoring program and an internship program, among other things, all of our outreach as well. So it's kind of functioning like a CTE director, but on a specific school site. Um, and so we developed some, some great programs at Claremont that I would love to share with you. And I'm sure there, there's some things that will feel familiar, things you've seen before. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Oh, I should also mention, um, uh, as of Friday, I will no longer be at Claremont High School. If you look for me on the website, I will not be there. Um, I have uh, decided to um, accept a position at my church, but I'm also going part-time with Connect Ed National um, that I know does a lot of work um, around the country. Um, and so I, am, I have already signed a contract with them and I'm gonna be consulting with them. Um, so I will still be kind of have one foot in education, so to speak. <laughs> That's why um, you'll see later in the presentation, I listed my personal email and not my work email. So I'd like to start with this. Um, I am a, a strong believer in structure. I believe that structure is a bit like a story. People will go along with you when they see where you're going. And I have found this to be very true of industry partners specifically. Um, when they, they will get involved if you get give them very specific details about how to be involved. And if they can walk into a system that is already pre-built and structured, they know exactly what to expect. Um, that is where I have had the most success in getting them involved. And so you'll see that all of my presentation kind of has one thread theme um, through it today. And that is structure, <laughs> build the structure and they will come. Um, and so that I believe is really the secret to successful programs that involve work-based learning is building a structure um, and making it so easy for them to participate that they enjoy it and that they can't really say no and they continue to come back year after year. So we'll talk a little bit about the structure first. And then um, I'll talk specifically about the mentoring program that I started on our campus, as well as the internship program and how that sort of sustains over how it's uh, been sustaining, I guess I should say. So um, if I were to boil it down to sort of six steps that I would take to build a mentoring or internship program, or really any new program, if you wanna have a guest speaker program or a job shadowing program or anything that you, know, you may already be doing, um, these are kind of the, you know, no nonsense, the things that we kind of all know to be true, but I just thought I'd really lay it out black and white um, for how to kind of set those things up. So, and you'll see that our program follows this sort of model. Um, I'm a firm believer in organizing things, um, probably too much. <laughs> so um, I went, before I ever ask an industry partner to participate in anything, 
I create the calendar with all the dates involved. I create a guide or a handbook if one is needed. I create the flyer. I put everything on the website. I don't want them walking into something that's sort of half half ready. Um, I want it completely built before I show it to them. Um, so that is step one, organizing. Step two, when we recruit um, and train, I think it's really important to give people information about their roles and not just the industry partners, but everybody involved. You'll see later in this presentation with our mentoring and internship program, we had um, very specific orientations for each audience. Parents have an orientation. Kids have an orientation. Industry partners have an orientation about every, all expectations. So I think that is an important step that we should not skip. Um, step three, setting up all the communication in advance has been a, a really helpful trick for me over the years. Um, I use canned emails. I don't know if anyone uses those in Google. They're awesome. You can preset a whole bunch of emails that can go out automatically um, when, you, when you receive a feedback on something. I also just keep a running doc of all the emails that I send out. For example, something like the mentoring program, which is an annual program, we kind of start over each fall. A lot of the types of emails that I'm going to send out to our industry partners each year are going to be very similar. Um, queuing them about the next meeting, queuing them about our job shadow event or whatever. There's no reason to reinvent the wheel. So I just keep all those emails in a running Word doc. And every year I'm just cutting and pasting, cutting and pasting and changing out dates. And it, it makes things way easier. Um, so I, I also have found that using industry protocols goes a long way with industry partners. They appreciate having an agenda sent out in an email ahead of time. They always appreciate those calendar invites. And so some of those niceties that they're used to, um, metrics they appreciate and things like that. So step four, um, executing with purpose. I believe in giving very clear expectations to everybody involved. So um, making sure they know their level of commitment right on point, right? We're expecting you to come out one hour a month. This is the start date. This is the end date. This is what I want you to do during the meeting. This is what you will not do, right? Like, um, and having all that in advance, um, I think really takes a lot of the guesswork out of them so that when they sign up, they really know what they're signing up for. And then um, step five would be after launching the program, making sure that you are really following up and getting feedback from them. This is something I feel like we've done a good job of over the last years with our mentor program. We always send out an end of um, program survey and they have great ideas for how to improve the program and make it better and change the handbook and whatever. Also getting students to write thank you letters has been a huge, huge win for us over the years because those mentors come back, man, when they get those thank you, those heartfelt thank you letters from students, um, we actually have them type them out and write, um, write them in class. And so that's huge. And, and then actually taking that feedback and doing something with it, of course. And then last but not least, um, making sure to systematize and track what you've done in, in past years and above all, keeping that, that you know, database of partners, right? So that you can call on them again. It's been my experience that a partner that volunteers for one thing will probably volunteer for the next thing you ask them to do if they had a good experience. Um, and we found that to be true each year. We've been running the mentor program now for probably 15 years. And I would say we get about 50% rollover each year. So about half of the mentors come back the following year or in a year, a couple of years later, right? If their schedule gets changed. Um, this is something I think we're probably all pretty familiar with, but just so we're clear at what we were doing at Claremont, we really had a, a continuum of work-based learning experiences that sort of crescendos into the mentor program and the Career Pathways internship. Um, we ran the internship as part of a course, which I will explain later in more detail. Um, but I did want you to just quickly get a oh, yeah. glimpse at some of the things that went on. I so appreciate it. I probably all of you. Um, we just wanted to make sure that um, you guys understood kind of what the underpinnings were before our students get into the mentoring and internship program. They do a lot of experiences in the younger grade levels to kind of prepare for that. We have a freshman foundations class, which is a lot of um, career readiness skills and work-based learning sort of 
entry level stuff. And then um, a lot of work in the 10th grade with a digital portfolio and a mock interview experience. And so all those things are happening sort of building toward. We run our mentoring program in the 11th grade. I found that to be a great age. Um, kids have a lot of questions in that age. They're making a lot of big decisions in that year about future. And then the 12th graders um, is where we run our internship program. Doesn't have to be that way, but that's how we've traditionally done it, so. Um, a couple of tips. I'm sure you guys probably know all these tricks already, but I'm just gonna throw them out there because people have told me in the past that they have been useful. Um, I, to find our industry partners, we, you know, as a site, we weren't really a district so much looking for them, but a site, um, we just came up with lots of tips and tricks for, for getting folks. So some of the things that worked well for us in the past were obviously tapping into past volunteers for anything. I should also add tapping into our parent community was huge um, because they are very connected and they have lots of professionals, right? Um, we would advertise in our local paper. Uh, one thing that we used to do is what I called a, um, like an entry level event. So we would do something at the beginning of the year that was for the kids, but wasn't really for the kids, if you know what I mean. It was more like to get people in the door. <laughs> so they would meet the kids. Um, it was really more, I probably should pick a different term for this, but it was kind of like a gateway drug. <laughs> it's like, get them in the door, meet the students. And they go, wow, what a cool program you have here. Oh, wow, you have a mentor program, an internship program. And it was really, so an example of that would be, we would have like a career industry panel sometime in September or October, the beginning of the school year. And they would just get to come in. It was a very like, low level participation. They could come in for half an hour, share about their career on a panel in sort of in different industry themes. Um, but as part of that event, they would get a little spiel about all the other programs that our school offered and how they could get involved. And they would get a menu of how of ways they could be involved with the kids. Um, and then we would get their business cards <laughs> and invite them back to the next thing we were doing. So that was a, a huge one. Um, one year we had our students write letters to local industry partners, um, either someone they knew from a parent or a friend of a friend or a cold call to someone in the local community. And that was super successful. Um, getting a letter from a student is way different than getting a letter from an adult who's trying to get them to do something. So that was pretty fun. So those are just a couple of the tips um, that have worked great for us in the past. But let's go ahead and dig in um, to some of the details of the mentor program um, and the way we ran it. There's lots of different ways to do it, I'm sure. We ran a very structured program. So just um, in a nutshell, this is kind of how we did it. We, um, at our school, we had four industry pathways in it and we're wall to wall. So every student was in a pathway. We had a business, engineering, medical and um, information technology pathway. But you did not have to have pathways to do this program. Um, we just happened to have them on our campus. So um, we separated our students by pathway because they knew each other and because they had a, a couple core teachers that they knew in that academy. And what we did is we recruited for mentors and we usually got enough to get four to one, um, meaning that there would be four students matched with one mentor. The smaller the ratio, the better, in my opinion. Um, some years we have been down to like a two to one ratio or even a one to one when, I, when our program was not school wide. And that was super effective. Um, just to give you an idea, uh, on our campus, that was about 200 students total. So all of our 11th graders participated in the mentoring program. So um, last year, for example, we had about 60 mentors. Um, so that was terrific. We have embedded those meetings into the school day. I would not recommend having them after school. I think it's way more effective for the students to um, be doing it during a class. And, and if you can capture them in a class where the teacher is willing to help and be aware and hold them accountable, that's even better. We held our meetings on campus in our library, which was sort of a large scale meeting room um, with individual tables for each mentor group. And then um, the topics, were focused around lots of different items. I'll, I think I have a list of them in the, in the next slide, but basically we give the mentors an entire handbook. And so all of the monthly agenda topics and, and things they talk about in the meeting, it's there's no guesswork. It's not like, what are we gonna talk about this month? It is, there's an agenda, there's talking points, there's directions for the mentor, there's activities pre-built in there. And so they walk in the door with like a handbook of what to do. And they um, have shared over the years that they really appreciate that. 
uh, the structure of knowing exactly what each meeting is going to be about. Uh, usually in February, we would work in a job shadow. And so the group of students would do a shadow with their mentor, either at their um, workplace or if their mentor had a friend or a couple of friends. Um, and it, that evolved into lots of different cool things. Sometimes mentors would say, well, can we all visit a college together and look at different departments that all the kids are interested in? Great. Sometimes um, the mentors set up a panel at their work of like different roles in their office and the kids got to experience that. Um, sometimes uh, what last year was challenging with COVID and some industries were not accepting guests and things like that. So we got very creative and some of our our groups went and did community service instead of a job shadow. So there's lots of ways to go with it, but the kids loved getting off campus and doing something special with their mentor. I highly recommend having a mentor program coordinator on site. Um, if it's, it could be a teacher, but it is a, a lot of work. If you're gonna run a really structured program and communicate well with all of your partners. Um, and so it's ideal if that person is not uh, in the classroom. But having teacher support since we were running it during the school day was super important. Um, the way we facilitated it, the teachers really did not do anything except prepare students for the meetings. And by prepare students for the meetings, what I mean is they would give them a prepared like slideshow of slides that I created for them in advance about what the meeting was going to be. And so that the kids were walking in prepared for the meetings and not um, showing up without stuff or not knowing what to expect. Once the students were in the meeting though, the entire meeting from start to finish is facilitated by the mentors. The, the teachers do not do anything. The program coordinator, I did not do anything. The mentors know that they are in charge of the meetings and they lead those meetings. Um, and that what has been very effective. Um, just to give you, this is our flyer for, let's see, last year's mentoring program. I know it's kind of tiny, but if you can see on the right there, um, some of the topics, these are the things that were in the mentor handbook. So the first meeting was about communication and, you know, introductions. We would do a whole meeting on goal setting. Our third meeting, we would have a college panel where the mentors become the panel, but they talk about their college experiences. Um, we did something called roadmap interviews where the students interview their mentor and ask them the question, how did you get from from high school when you graduated to where you are today and hearing sort of all the, the twists and turns that, that people took to get into their careers is really interesting. Um, in February, since it was job shadow month and we didn't have a meeting on campus, the kids would go out for a field trip. We did do a mentor mingle. Um, that was super fun. We did a mocktail party, <laughs> had them on campus and they, they like to meet each other. That's the cool thing. They like to meet each other and network also. Um, in March, we did something on future finance planning. Uh, April was all about resume and interview skills. So kids would prepare a resume and bring them in and they get feedback from their mentors and then practice interview questions. And in May, we always did sort of an affirmations closing ceremony. We would, we would cater and do a banquet. Um, and last year we did a superhero theme, which was really fun. So all the kids got to take pictures with like superhero costumes on. <laughs> so it was great. Um, and that gives you kind of a, the big picture. Now, um, the system running behind this program is, I'm just going to click into a few links here just to show you. So as we talked earlier, um, you got to set up that system before you invite people into it. So one of the first things we would set up is each year, the mentor handbook. And I'm just taking you to our website um, real briefly. I'm just going to skim through a couple things so you can see some examples. This is a handbook um, from a couple years past. It's taking a long time to load. Sorry about that. But um, this was provided in PDF and hard copy to all the mentors. And so just to give you a little idea, here's the table of contents. But you can see all of the session agendas are included. The first part is orientation materials. And this is what we would do with the mentors in an orientation. They had to do a mandatory orientation before participating. Um, and then all the topics here, we'll just look maybe real quickly at one sample agenda, but um, let's see, maybe meeting one. And if we're going into the weeds too much, please feel free to tell me to move on. But um, this would be an example of what we would give them for a meeting agenda. So it kind of lays out for them what they're doing, how much time to spend on each activity. There's always a little icebreaker. And then any activity we ask them to do, we provide it. So the activities are in here. And I should mention the kids also get a handbook. And so everyone comes with their handbook. They can write right in the handbook. Um, 
and they can do all the activities sort of in sync together. So that's just a little sneak peek at um, our handbook, which I'm happy to share. The other thing that we were um, very rigid about is making sure all of our mentors signed up on an application form. And so, and it was pretty lengthy uh, for a couple reasons. First of all, we do vet the mentors. They did get fingerprinted and had to fill out all of our volunteer information um, to be a volunteer in the school district. But the second reason is that this um, form not only provided contact information, but it also, if, if we were to go later in the form, which it's not going to let me unless I start filling it out, but um, unless I can go into edit mode, maybe, and I can show you guys. Yeah, let's do that. Um, the second half of this application was extensive questions about their personality. And the reason for that is that we are using that information to match them to their student groups. So the, the matching of the student groups was not random. Um, we got the teachers involved because they know their students and we would read these profiles. The students created a profile also with a lot of the same questions actually. So you can get into some of them here. We, at, we would ask them, why are you motivated to mentor? What are your personality traits, your beliefs, your interests, your hobbies? And then down to things like, what kind of music do you like? What kind of holidays, travel, all that good stuff, school subjects. Um, this, was, this was where the secret sauce was because if you can match up the students with some interests with their mentors, even if they don't have an industry that they're interested in, if they didn't have a career, that the student was interested in, if they could match up on some pretty key personality things, um, they really would bond and connect. And that was what we wanted. So um, students and mentors would fill out a registration form. And again, that was a form that we created before we even open up the, the email and sent out, hey, mentor program starting. So we created all of those, put them on our website. Let me go back for a sec. We did, like I mentioned, do background checks on all of our mentors. And then we held orientations. Um, we would have student orientations. We did it different ways, sometimes in teacher's classes, sometimes in an assembly. But the students got a very detailed orientation about what is the mentor program? Why do we do it? How do we expect you to act? How are you going to treat your mentor? How are you going to communicate with your mentor? Um, all of that ahead of time. We also did one for parents. Um, uh, we've done it different ways at open house, through Zoom, whatever. Uh, you could even do a video recording. And then the orientation for mentors, again, was very involved. Um, these are a little bit older slides, but we, um, we mandated that all mentors do a two-hour orientation with us. And that could also be done over Zoom. But all the things that that we basically had seen go wrong <laughs> in the past of how mentors didn't know how to handle X, Y, Z, or communication failed because of this or that, we basically worked into the orientation. So first an overview about our school and the kids and kind of what to expect, our demographic and things like that. But then we would go through the mentor handbook and then we would talk about their commitments, um, how we expected them to, to act, how we wanted them to attend every meeting, how to have an effective mentoring relationship, even getting into things like how to talk to teenagers, right? Um, how to not get upset if they, you know, don't, email you back because they don't use email anymore. They use Snapchat, right? Like things like that. <laughs> so um, all of that uh, went in, uh, in advance before mentors even met their students. We collected student profiles as well. Um, and then we did the matching. And so the matching is always really fun. It's a, it was intensive, but the teachers would come in. We'd read, we literally would just hand read the profiles. Could you randomize it? Yes, you could. Um, is it better if you kind of really read the profiles and try to stick kids with mentors that have common interests? I think so. Um, and then we would make everyone sign their life away, <laughs> right? Forms and contracts, um, really just for awareness. We wanted kids and parents to sign what they were agreeing to. Sorry, my computer's running slow today, but it would look something like this. Um, their agreements about how they would behave and you know, the parents would be aware that their mentor was gonna be seeing their student all year. Another cool thing we started doing just a couple of years ago is having the mentors write an introduction letter to the parents. And that was really cool. And then we would hold those meetings. But um, as you can see, once you've done all the front loading and everyone has a handbook and everyone knows what to expect, the meetings themselves were really pretty easy. 
um, they ran themselves. The mentors knew what to do. They'd walk in, they conduct the meetings. We have all the dates on the calendar for the year and just everyone knew. Um, my role became reminders about meetings, calendar invites, scheduling makeups if a, if a mentor had to miss, um, keeping tracks of students, facilitating things like the job shadows and the field trips and things like that. But other than that, um, September's busy. <laughs> but after that, the, the program was very um, uh, self, self-sustaining, I, I suppose you could say. So that would happen in the 11th grade year. The wonderful thing about the mentoring program is it really breaks the ice so that students kind of know how to conduct themselves in a professional way and how to speak to an adult sort of face-to-face -face professionally. Um, and knowing that they were all gonna go into the internship program in the 12th grade year, we would really hit that stuff hard in the mentoring program. At Claremont, we did offer an internship program in 12th grade year. And so the way we ran that program is it was uh, through a class. And so uh, we were fortunate to have a class recognized in our school district called Exploratory Work Experience. There's actually two. There's one called Exploratory Work Experience and one called Career Pathways Internship. Um, we were able to get approved a double block class. So at our school, we, we ran a four by four. So our periods were 90 minutes long. Our internship class, if students took it, they received two block periods. So that was a total of, you know, three hours basically back to back. And with that embedded in their day, they had enough time to get off campus and back if they were to work off, off site, which they did. Um, so the way we ran the program, um, our goal was to have all of our 12th graders take the class, but it wasn't elective. And so a few kids opted out, but most of them did take it. Um, the first five weeks of the course, our students would be in seat every day. And so those 12th graders were coming and we affectionately called that five week intro boot camp. <laughs> and it was all about how to get ready for an internship. Um, and so we'll show you a little bit more about the class in a minute, but it was all about um, work readiness skills, making a LinkedIn page, networking, looking for an internship or um, looking at the job postings we provided, which I'll explain. But just to give you sort of the high level, our interns would work 10 to 12 weeks. So after the five week introduction, we would release them out and they would no longer be required to come to school. Instead, they um, could go off campus and work at their internship placement site. And um, depending on their, their schedule with other classes involved, right? Um, every intern schedule looked a little bit differently. Typically our interns would work a minimum of 75 hours total um, over the course of 10 to 12 weeks. And so that was the equivalent of about seven to 10 hours a week. Most of our internships were unpaid, but we did have a few paid ones. Um, the kids love those, of course. And then what we did require is that they would come to school and attend one class period per week. And that was the check-in with their internship instructor. And um, that was a chance for students to not only reflect, but also to troubleshoot any uh, issues they were having at their internship, as well as turn in timesheets, uh, we did have all of our intern supervisors do formal evaluations of the student interns at least twice. Our internship teacher and coordinator um, would communicate weekly with all the intern supervisors on an email. Um, and then we did go to a digital format for submitting timesheets and, and supervisors would sign off on those hours. And the student's grade was based heavily on their attendance at their internship and the evaluations that their supervisors gave them on site. So once again, um, that program had a system running behind it. <laughs> and at uh, the risk of sounding like a broken record, um, we would do quite a bit of organizing before the students ever entered the class or before we would ever reach out to our local community. I would say about 75% of our internships came from us reaching out to our community and offering that we had interns at our high school and then getting them to sign up and register to request an intern. The other 25% were student found. And so students might come in with connections or have an idea or know a parent, and they might pursue something on their own and secure their own internship. And that, that's very effective when the students do that. The more, the better. Um, we did a lot of preparation with our interns. So um, I think this takes us to a overview of the internship course. Yeah, this is a syllabus. Um, from our internship course a couple years back. 
but um, you can see that some of the things that we would cover with them, essentials in the workplace, we would talk about resumes and cover letters and interview technique as a, sort of a brush up. Um, talking about the, you know, the nuts and bolts of exactly how the internship would go. And when they sign out, you know, they're signing, saying they're going to their internship and nowhere else and all of that. But then once they would actually start the internship, most of what they would turn in were weekly blogs about their work, signed timesheets and reflections of that nature, and maybe be reading a book in addition to that, that sort of coincided. We had an internship handbook as well. We have definitely updated this since the one I'm about to show you, I think is an old link, but um, just the idea of a handbook, I think goes a long way with supervisors. So the, this could be given to either the supervisor or the student, and it has a, a ton of information about the program, but also all the expectations and contracts involved for them to leave campus, um, everything about everything that employers would want to know about who covers workman's comp and all of that as well would be in here. But then we would add a lot of things in here for the supervisors like, hey, just so you know, this is how we're grading the interns. Or um, here's the parent contract that we ask our interns to sign. Here's the standards of conduct that we expect. We would give them um, a couple forms to use on the first day, right? So in their orientation, we found that a lot of internships varied on how they would to what degree they would orient their students. So we created sort of a standardized, this is how to orient your interns and give it to them. Say, fill this out, make sure you set your calendar and pick your work hours together and sort of agree to it. We would give them an orientation checklist um, in case they didn't have one. Some of these are small businesses and they maybe aren't used to onboarding interns. Um, we'd give them a sample timesheet and whatnot. So you can see um, quite a bit there in that handbook. And then we would recruit and register. So we would send sort of a blast out to our community. And similar to our mentor program, we would have a Google form where they would register. Um, one super wonderful thing that I discovered in Google Forms is um, a nifty little app called Form Publisher. Write it down, you will love this app, Form Publisher, if you haven't used it. And what that does is um, it takes your Google Form and you can create a one-page template um, that will populate automatically when someone fills out your form. And that one page template, we turned into a job posting. So what that means is anytime a new supervisor would register saying, I want an intern, we would make them list hours, you know, location, um, how many interns you want, what are the requirements, you know, skills you're looking for, all of that. When they would fill that out, the little app, form publisher, telling you, uh, would create a job posting from that. And we would give access um, to those job postings to our student interns. And so there was almost like a job board each time a new person would register. Um, kids loved that because then they could flip through and look at all the different positions that they wanted to apply for. Once again, we would give orientations, orientations for everyone, interns, supervisors, parents, everybody, teachers, um, anyone involved. And then the biggest thing we learned over the years was to do an interview fair. And so we would hold that on campus. And I have some slides about that in a moment. But that interview fair was, was huge. We would ask the supervisors, anybody who requested an intern, we would highly encourage them to come to the interview fair where we would facilitate and host all the supervisors. And we would require our interns to interview with at least three different internships. Because um, what sounds good on paper is, is not always the same when they get face to face with somebody and meet their boss. So we would require interns to come dressed professionally with multiple resumes in hand. They would schedule out appointments and they would get a chance to interview with everyone who was requesting. And then we would reserve the right to make final matches and determinations. Um, I'll, I'll explain that more in a moment. And then we would send those interns out three to four days a week for, like I said, seven to 10 hours a week. We would um, collect all of their data back. And then of course, at the end, we would have them do a very intensive exit presentation about their internship and what they contributed and what they learned. We would invite the supervisors to that. We would invite district dignitaries and principals and whatnot as well to see that. Um, so, I think I'll skip over this. This is a little flyer, but it is helpful to have a flyer. I'll just say that about your program that you can hand out to the community and post out and send out and social media out and all of that good stuff. The, the class breakdown, um, just to give a little bit more 
I, I think I did cover most of this already, but we did, our, our class format was two periods blocked together, which was 180 minutes total. First five weeks, students in seat, Week six through 17, they're working um, Monday through Thursday. We found Friday to be a good day to have them back in class because seniors have a lot of things going on on Fridays, like football games they want to be at and whatnot. So it's nice to have them back on campus. And then the last week would be their presentation. And we did have one instructor who was designated as our internship instructor. This is a couple of pictures from our interview fair. And so you can see below here are the, that's the one pager that I told you form publisher would generate. Those are the job postings. We would give every interviewer a job ranking form. So when they would meet their interns that they interview, they would rank them for us and tell us who they really wanted and why. Um, but we would also ask them, you know, would you, would you take this intern or not? So they had sort of the final say in if they would hire or not but we did reserve the right for final placements because we know the students and we were able to finagle things, right? Um, if we know a student needed something closer to home or something like that, we could make sure to make those final placements. We would have nameplates for the interviews that were all taking place simultaneously in our library. Um, so that was the interview fair. And just to give you kind of the big picture of how we might do um, a spring semester, we would start in January with our intern boot camp. Um, really early, we'd start doing all those supervisor orientations and, and then close the window for interns to be requested. And then we would do those um, orientations, interview fairs. Then that week right after the interviews, we would make contact with the supervisors for final placements. And then shortly after that, interns would start to work. Um, we always give them breaks, right, that follow the school district breaks, and then toward the end of the semester, those final presentations. So, um, yeah, it was great. All right, so I'm going to, I am going to, this is, this is a little tool that we have. It, it might be useful, it might not um, for you, but I can definitely throw a link in the chat for this. This is um, an action plan template that we have used in the past to create a new program. So anytime you're trying to launch a program, should you want to launch a mentorship program or something like that? Um, it's kind of just something that walks you through the things you might want to think about as you are beginning to plan for that in advance. Um, I'll go ahead and throw the link in the chat for everybody. And then I will go ahead and stop sharing and take some questions. <laughs> so let's... Uh, Let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to throw that action plan template in the chat there. And I know I talked for a long time. Sorry, Heather, but I'll stop and let you maybe facilitate some questions. <laughs> no, you were getting lots of shout outs and questions in the chat here. And so I don't know if the folks who put the questions want to go off mute or I can just ping them for you all. I know there was a quick question about um, that I believe I answered correctly, but it's the mentor works with each small group, right? Mentors don't work as like a group. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, it would be one mentor to a small student group or one on one if you can get enough mentors. <laughs> yes. Um, there was a question about how many work sites that you have. Um, in the internship program, I assume that means mm -hmm. um, it would vary year to year because some internships would take multiple interns. But I would say um, most recently we had about 150 interns in our internship program. There was probably maybe 40 different placements um all over the place from different industries so but some of them we had relationships with over the years like an example um we have a great relationship with mossy toyota and they have multiple entry points they have you know a business side to their industry but they also have people working on cars and things like that so we just created a great relationship with them and our interns early on did a nice job and so um, every year the ceo would just call me up and say I want six interns or I want 10 interns or I want, you know, and so we, we just kind of would hold the spots for them, which was terrific. <laughs> so. And I know you and I, I remember way back, gosh, it was like last March, um, talking about the whole internship matching. And I love that you all have the final say. And I think we had talked about where it's like, at some point you just have all the papers on a table and you're just trying to like match the papers and like, is there a better way? And like, there really just isn't, right? This is a very human relationship thing that you're about to like match for, right? So you do a lot of that beginning work, right? You have to interview each other, you understand all of them to the best of your ability. 
And then you, you, you have to kind of put it all out on a table and make that match and have some discussions. And sometimes you might disagree as a team who goes where, but kind of work through it. Yeah, we have found that to make a more successful placement and match in the mentor program. Um, and, you know, with the internship program, it's almost like the draft. Like we were able to, after so many years, you have some partners who you know, and they just come back year to year for more interns. And um, I can give an example, like there, there would be, we, we had a good relationship with someone at State Farm and he just loved taking kiddos. And he had a heart for the kids after a couple of years of doing the program. And so he was our go-to. We'd be like, Steve, we have, we're going to give you your number one choice over here, superstar, so-and-so. But also this young man over here is, is having a rough go. Like he, he didn't interview well, but he needs, he needs a break basically. And we'd say, we'll give you your number one if you also take you know, your number seven pick. And, and, and those things would work out great because um, you kind of give a little, take a little and, and create the best situation, not just for the supervisor, but also for the student. And that was helpful, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I like the track. <laughs> um, there was a question too, and I can stop reading them if you want to go off mute too, but about requiring the orientation for all stakeholders and how you might have held them accountable for that. And while you answer that, I'm actually going to put, I have a link to the presentation because I know some folks want the resources. I'll throw that in the chat. Yes. Um, how to require orientation. Um, yeah, I mean, I just bothered them a lot. <laughs> I guess I, just, I made them think that they couldn't do it unless they did the orientation. I mean, I mean, pretty simply, like they, I wouldn't let them in the door with, with the kiddos if, unless they did it. I mean, unless there was someone who had been a return mentor for four or five years, right? And I already knew them. They knew the spiel. But yes, um, I would, I put on everything, the flyers, the website, everything, new mentors must attend orientation, but we would offer multiple entry points. So they could do it either in person Um after COVID, we started offering a Zoom option. And then even last year, I did a video recording of one of the Zoom orientations. And then I posted it on the website and said, if you are not able to attend in person, you do need to watch this video. And then I would just ask them basically to sign something that said they had watched it. <laughs> so, um, but you know what I did find? They want the orientation. Most of them want the orientation. Like they don't, they're afraid to come in and sit down with four teenagers for an hour. Like they want to know what to do. So um, I would just always swing it less like, hey, I'm making you do this. And more like, you want to come to this. Like we're going to help you feel prepared for what you're about to embark on. Um, and they, I think they would end up appreciating the, the orientation at the end of the day. <laughs> Yeah, I think we forget sometimes like the like partners who haven't worked with young people in a while are actually kind of scared of engaging with young people, right? Like I, I, my daughter's kindergarten teacher found out I used to teach high school and they're like, oh my gosh, I would just cry if I had to teach high school. And I would cry in your room. Like I would cry in a room of 30 kindergartners, right? So it's like, we have to kind of understand that too. And Laura, I see you had a question and I've gone off mute here. Yeah, well, I actually have a couple. My one question that I put in the chat was, thank you first for this presentation. We really appreciate your time. Um, but what are you using to manage your partner database? Like, are, is that a spreadsheet? Is it a data, like an actual database? What are you using? Elizabeth? Yeah, so um, we were just using a database. I, I'm I'm a, a kind of an Excel geek. And so I was using Excel. I would not say that I am like the best person to talk to about that. I think there's probably other formats and people who do it better, <laughs> but I did, I used um, a spreadsheet and that's how I would, you know, copy down contacts to blast things out and went on. I would tag them um, in different columns for if, if, so if they volunteered as a mentor, for example, I'd have a column and tag them as a mentor. And then each year to year, I'd go back and look through. Um, uh, right as I, as, as I am, have one foot out the door. We did just purchase a program called um, Seamless WBL. Okay. It's called Seamless WBL. Mm -hmm. And I have heard that some folks um, around the nation have had good success with that. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, we did kind of a test drive of it. I liked it, but I did not use it full force. So I can't really testify uh, as to how good of a platform it is, but I did hear good things about it. So I'll throw that out there. <laughs> Thank you. And I have one more question, um, if, if I may. So the, the juniors that are getting the mentorship, is that the same 150 juniors get the mentorship and then next year, those same students are in the internship program? 
Yes, ideally. Um, the only difference would be the juniors we required to participate in the mentoring program unless their parents opted them out, which very few did. Um, and the reason we were able to do that is because we worked it into their CTE course during the school day. The interns, um, we really pushed at our school, all seniors will take an internship either fall or spring. In inevitably, there's some students who had course conflicts or schedule conflicts or needed to like recuperate credits to graduate. And so other things had to be prioritized. So I would say about 85% of the seniors would take that class. Um, and so unless they had a scheduling conflict, they would be scheduled into the internship class. So you, you only have about 150 seniors or whatever that works out to be? Yeah, we have about, every year we have about 180, 200. We're a very small campus. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> but yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? There was one more in the chat and then open it up too as folks have more, but about um, the interns meeting in the class every Friday. And do they meet during different periods, right? Because you have 115, I think it was, um, how that's accommodated, assuming how they rotate or are in cohort. Yeah. Yes, they would be during different periods. So um, we would block our internship classes either period one, two, or period two, three, or three, four. And we had two teachers teaching the course. And so um, they would come. Um, on the Fridays in class, they would not come for the full two block periods. They'd only be required to come for one of those periods. And they knew it was their check-in and it was once a week. And they had a lot of things due on that day <laughs> to motivate them to be there. Um, our internship teachers started reading, um, what is that famous book with the parachute? Why is it? I'm blanking on it. Anyone know what I'm talking about? <laughs> it's a great book. What color is my parachute? That there one? it is. Thank that you. One, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Laura. Mm -hmm. um, what color is my parachute? Um, that lined up really well with discussions around what was happening in the workplace and questions to ask their supervisor. Uh, we would have them do an all industry, all aspects of the industry report on their company as well. So um, they, they have something to do and talk about each Friday. Yeah. <laughs> For credit. We had a, I'm always terrible at history. I can never remember dates or remember all these pieces. I remember my teacher would offer extra credit each quarter for like reading a book. And I love to read. So I was always like, yes, it's like <laughs> history. Um, so I love that the internship course is a bit of a book club. Other questions, we have a few moments. It was incredible information and definitely encourage you all. Like those resources are like all there to use. There's more even on the Claremont website beyond the presentation, like that's just what I think is so incredible about the work you all do is how much you share it, right? Like a lot of times you can't really find out about what schools are doing. Yes, we like to share. <laughs> and I see some other folks throwing in thoughts about databases and employers. It's, yeah, it's an ongoing struggle, right? All the different learning management systems too and systems you're used to and... And um, like Heather said, there, there is a ton of, I showed some handbooks and things today that were a little out of date, but, and I actually didn't mean to do that. I forgot to update the links, but our Claremont website has all of this year's information. So you can find a PDF of our handbook on there for this year for mentor and internship program. I think something I was really excited about for Liz coming here today was that the mentoring program, while it is, it's a lift to be a lift to get up off the ground. It really is something that every school can do. Right. And internships is something every school can do, too. But I know people always kind of tend to go wide eyed and get a little nervous about internships and all those liability and payment pieces and all that fun stuff to go, that goes into that. Um, but the mentoring program is just a really thoughtful way to connect students with other people and even with each other. Right. Like one to one is awesome. But even that two to one, three to one, four to one. Right. They can start to form their own cohort and their own kind of personal board of directors, right? That they start kind of pinging ideas and questions and thoughts off of. So Liz, I appreciate you so much here today and good luck. Congrats on your new role. I know Claremont will miss you very much. Yes, very sad, very sad, but uh, exciting as well. So um, thank you all very much. It's really exciting to see all, all the faces from around the nation and everyone doing similar things. It's really cool. Mm -hmm.